This is a LibriVox recording. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, Chapter Twenty Four, Foreshadowings. Two days after this, Alfred St. Clair and Augustine parted, and Eva who had been stimulated by the society of her young cousin to exertions beyond her strength, began to fail rapidly. St. Clair was at last willing to call in medical advice, a thing from which he had always shrunk, because it was the admission of an unwelcome truth. But, for a day or two, Eva was so unwell as to be confined to the house, and the doctor was called. Marie St. Clair had taken no notice of the child's gradually decaying health and strength, because she was completely absorbed in studying out two or three new forms of disease to which she believed she herself was a victim. It was the first principle of Marie's belief that nobody ever was or could be so great a sufferer as herself, and therefore she always repelled quite indignantly any suggestion that any one around her could be sick. She was always sure, in such a case, that it was nothing but laziness, or want of energy, and that if they had had the suffering she had, they would soon know the difference. Miss Ophelia had several times tried to awaken her maternal fears about Eva, but to no avail. "'I don't see as anything ails the child,' she would say. "'She runs about and plays.' "'But she has a cough.' "'Cough?' You don't need to tell me about a cough. I've always been subject to a cough all my days. When I was Eva's age, they thought I was in a consumption. Night after night, Mammy used to sit up with me. Oh, Eva's cough is not anything. That she gets weak, and is short-breathed. Law, I've had that years and years. It's only a nervous affection. But she sweats so nights. Well, I have these ten years. Very often, night after night, my clothes will be wringing wet. There won't be a dry thread in my night-clothes, and the sheets will be so that Mammy has to hang them up to dry. Eva doesn't sweat anything like that." Miss Ophelia shut her mouth for a season, but now that Eva was fairly and visibly prostrated and a doctor called, Marie, all on a sudden, took a new turn. "'She knew it,' she said. She always felt it, that she was destined to be the most miserable of mothers. Here she was, with her wretched health and her only darling child going down to the grave before her eyes and Marie routed up Mammy's nights, and rumpused and scolded, with more energy than ever, all day, on the strength of this new misery. "'My dear Marie, don't talk so,' said St. Clair. "'You ought not to give up the case so, at once.' "'You have not a mother's feeling, St. Clair. You never could understand me. You don't know. But don't talk so, as if it were a gone case. I can't take it as indifferently as you can, St. Clair. If you don't feel when your only child is in this alarming state, I do. It's a blow too much for me, with all I was bearing before." "'It's true,' said St. Clair, "'that Eva is very delicate, that I always knew, and that she has grown so rapidly as to exhaust her strength, and that her situation is critical. But just now she is only prostrated by the heat of the weather, and by the excitement of her cousin's visit, and the exertions she made. The physician says there is room for hope. Well, of course, if you can look on the bright side, pray do. It's a mercy if people haven't sensitive feelings in this world. I am sure I wish I didn't feel as I do. It only makes me completely wretched. I wish I could be as easy as the rest of you." And the rest of them had good reason to breathe the same prayer, for Marie paraded her new misery as the reason and apology for all sorts of inflictions on every one about her. Every word that was spoken by anybody, everything that was done or was not done everywhere, was only a new proof that she was surrounded by hard-hearted, insensible beings who were unmindful of her peculiar sorrows. Poor Eva heard some of these speeches, and nearly cried her little eyes out in pity for her mamma, and in sorrow that she should make her so much distress. In a week or two there was a great improvement of symptoms one of those deceitful lulls, by which her inexorable disease so often beguiles the anxious heart, even on the verge of the grave. Eva's step was again in the garden, in the balconies. She played and laughed again, and her father, in a transport, declared that they should soon have her as hearty as anybody. Miss Ophelia, and the physician alone, felt no encouragement from this elusive truce. There was one other heart, too, that felt the same certainty 
and that was the little heart of Eva. What is it that sometimes speaks in the soul so calmly, so clearly, that its earthly time is short? Is it the secret instinct of decaying nature, or the soul's impulsive throb as immortality draws on? Be it what it may, it rested in the heart of Eva, a calm, sweet, prophetic certainty that heaven was near, calm as the light of sunset, sweet as the bright stillness of autumn. There her little heart reposed, only troubled by sorrow for those who loved her so dearly. For the child, though nursed so tenderly, and though life was unfolding before her with every brightness that love and wealth could give, had no regret for herself in dying. In that book which she and her simple old friend had read so much together, she had seen and taken to her young heart the image of one who loved the little child, and as she gazed and mused, he had ceased to be an image and a picture of the distant past, and come to be a living, all-surrounding reality. His love enfolded her childish heart with more than mortal tenderness, and it was to him, she said, she was going, and to his home. But her heart yearned with sad tenderness for all that she was to leave behind. Her father most, for Eva, though she never distinctly thought so, had an instinctive perception that she was more in his heart than any other. She loved her mother because she was so loving a creature, and all the selfishness that she had seen in her only saddened and perplexed her, for she had a child's implicit trust that her mother could not do wrong. There was something about her that Eva never could make out, and she always smoothed it over with thinking that, after all, it was Mama, and she loved her very dearly indeed. She felt, too, for those fond, faithful servants to whom she was as daylight and sunshine. Children do not usually generalize, but Eva was an uncommonly mature child, and the things that she had witnessed of the evils of the system under which they were living had fallen, one by one, into the depths of her thoughtful, pondering heart. She had vague longings to do something for them, to bless and save not only them, but all in their condition longings that contrasted sadly with the feebleness of her little frame. "'Uncle Tom,' she said one day, when she was reading to her friend, "'I can understand why Jesus wanted to die for us.' "'Why, Miss Eva?' "'Because I felt so, too.' "'What is it, Miss Eva? I don't understand.' "'I can't tell you. But when I saw those poor creatures on the boat, you know, when you came up and I—' Some had lost their mothers, and some their husbands, and some mothers cried for their little children. And when I heard about your poor Prue, oh, wasn't that dreadful? And a great many other times, I felt that I would be glad to die, if my dying could stop all this misery. I would die for them, Tom, if I could," said the child earnestly, laying her little thin hand on his. Tom looked at the child with awe and when she, hearing her father's voice, glided away, he wiped his eyes many times as he looked after her. "'It's just no use trying to keep Miss Eva here,' he said to Mammy, whom he met a moment after. "'She's got the Lord's mark in her forehead.' "'Ah, yes, yes,' said Mammy, raising her hands. "'I've allers said so. She wasn't never like a child that's to live. There was allers something deep in her eyes.' I've told Missus so many the time. It's a comin' true. We all sees it, dear little blessed lamb." Eva came tripping up the veranda steps to her father. It was late in the afternoon, and the rays of the sun formed a kind of glory behind her as she came forward in her white dress, with her golden hair and glowing cheeks, her eyes unnaturally bright with the slow fever that burned in her veins. St. Clair had called her to show a statuette that he had been buying for her. But her appearance, as she came on, impressed him suddenly and painfully. There is a kind of beauty so intense, yet so fragile, that we cannot bear to look at it. Her father folded her suddenly in his arms, and almost forgot what he was going to tell her. "'Eva, dear, you are better nowadays, are you not?' "'Papa,' said Eva, with sudden firmness, "'I've had things I wanted to say to you a great while. I want to say them now, before I get weaker." St. Clair trembled as Eva seated herself in his lap. She laid her head on his bosom and said, 
"'It's all no use, Papa, to keep it to myself any longer. The time is coming that I am going to leave you. I am going, and never to come back.' And Eva sobbed. "'Oh, now, my dear little Eva,' said St. Clair, trembling as he spoke, but speaking cheerfully, "'you've got nervous and low-spirited. You mustn't indulge such gloomy thoughts. See here, I've bought a statuette for you.' "'No, Papa,' said Eva, putting it gently away. "'Don't deceive yourself. I am not any better. I know it perfectly well. And I am going before long. I am not nervous. I am not low-spirited. If it were not for you, Papa, and my friends, I should be perfectly happy. I want to go. I long to go.' "'Why, dear child, what has made your poor little heart so sad? You have had everything to make you happy that could be given to you. I had rather be in heaven, though only for my friend's sake I would be willing to live. There are a great many things here that make me sad, that seem dreadful to me. I had rather be there, but I don't want to leave you. It almost breaks my heart. What makes you sad and seems dreadful, Eva? Oh, things that are done and done all the time. I feel sad for our poor people. They love me dearly, and they are all good and kind to me. I wish, Papa, they were all free." "'Why, Eva, child, don't you think they are well enough off now? Oh, but, Papa, if anything should happen to you, what would become of them? There are very few men like you, Papa. Uncle Alfred isn't like you, and Mama isn't. And then think of poor old Prue's owners. What horrid things people do, and can do!" And Eva shuddered. "'My dear child, you are too sensitive. I'm sorry I ever let you hear such stories.' "'Oh, that's what troubles me, Papa. You want me to live so happy, and never to have any pain, never suffer anything, not even hear a sad story, when other poor creatures have nothing but pain and sorrow in their lives. And it seems selfish. I ought to know such things. I ought to feel about them. Such things always sunk into my heart. They went down deep. I've thought and thought about them, Papa. Isn't there any way to have all slaves made free?" That's a difficult question, dearest. There's no doubt that this way is a very bad one. A great many people think so. I do myself. I heartily wish that there were not a slave in the land. But then, I don't know what is to be done about it. Papa, you are such a good man, and so noble and kind, and you always have a way of saying things that is so pleasant. Couldn't you go all around and try to persuade people to do right about this? When I am dead, Papa, then you will think of me, and do it for my sake. I would do it if I could. "'When you are dead, Eva,' said St. Clair passionately, "'oh, child, don't talk to me so. You are all I have on earth. Poor old Prue's child was all that she had, and yet she had to hear it crying, and she couldn't help it. Papa, these poor creatures love their children as much as you do me. Oh, do something for them. There's poor Mammy loves her children. I've seen her cry when she talked about them. And Tom loves his children, and it's dreadful, Papa, that such things are happening all the time." "'There, there, darling,' said St. Clair soothingly. "'Only don't distress yourself. Don't talk of dying, and I will do anything you wish. And promise me, dear father, that Tom shall have his freedom as soon as—' She stopped, and said in a hesitating tone, "'I am gone. Yes, dear, I will do anything in the world, anything you ask me to. Dear Papa, said the child, laying her burning cheek against his, how I wish we could go together. Where, dearest? said St. Clair. To our Saviour's home. It's so sweet and peaceful there. It is all so loving there. The child spoke unconsciously, as of a place where she had often been. Don't you want to go, Papa? she said. St. Clair drew her closer to him, but was silent. "'You will come to me,' said the child, speaking in a voice of calm certainty, which she often used unconsciously. "'I shall come after you. 
I shall not forget you. The shadows of the solemn evening closed round them deeper and deeper as St. Clair sat silently holding the little frail form to his bosom. He saw no more the deep eyes, but the voice came over him as a spirit voice, and, as in a sort of judgment vision, his whole past life rose in a moment before his eyes. His mother's prayers and hymns, his own early yearnings and aspirings for good, and, between them and this hour, years of worldliness and skepticism and what man calls respectable living. We can think much, very much, in a moment. St. Clair saw and felt many things, but spoke nothing, and, as it grew darker, he took his child to her bedroom, and, when she was prepared for rest, he sent away the attendants, and rocked her in his arms, and sung to her till she was asleep. End of chapter 24